Hi, this is Evo at Studio One on One. I'm the Mac head who's building his first music PC. Not just any old music PC, but a 16 core monster packed in a small portable case, which is well cooled and hopefully very silent. And oh yeah, I'm doing it for about a quarter of the cost of a comparatively spec Mac Pro. Not that that last bit is a particularly difficult challenge. The 16 core Mac Pro costs about 10K. So why am I putting myself through the trouble of researching and building a music PC? I've been using Macs pretty much exclusively for the last 20 years, but I grew up using Commodore 64, MSX2, and then Windows. So why did I switch to Mac? After only a few months of using Mac OS 9.2, I realized that I knew my way around it better than Windows, which I'd been using for at least as many years. An example is if you needed your IP address, that was effectively only one click away. And that was at least several clicks away on Windows. And if it was actually also only one click away, the question still remains how I didn't know about it after using it for so many years. I think the answer lies in the design. Another reason was that I realized that a 400 MHz Mac could run a whole multitrack session and mix, whereas a 400 MHz PC, fat chance. After I got introduced to Mac at college, I didn't have the money to buy one right away, so I got a 333 MHz fully SCSI PC. That thing should have been able to run at least 24 tracks of audio, right? Well, it could barely run eight. Now, maybe I just didn't configure it right, but the fact remained, and remains today, that a Mac pretty much runs audio fine right out of the box. This is an often overlooked advantage of Mac over PC that cannot be underestimated. You buy a Mac that is specced well enough for what you need to do in music, and you'll be pretty much good to go. On the PC side, this is not as straightforward. There are so many different possibilities of hardware combinations that just buying a PC with the right kind of processor, RAM, and drive is still no guarantee that it will work well for audio at all. So when I started my recording studio in 2001, I bought two PowerMac G4 Quicksilvers of 733 MHz each. This is them. I still think it's one of the best designs Apple ever did. Okay, it's a bit dated but not that dated. At first I ran them natively, using Digi001 interfaces, and later I upgraded to a light TDM system. I used that system professionally until 2012. I still own them, and they still work. In 2012, I bought a Mac Pro, six cores instead of one this time, and 3.33 gigahertz instead of 733 megahertz. The jump in performance was staggering, of course. This machine has served me well until today, and it's still purring away nicely at my recording studio. For recordings, it's just fine. For stereo mixes, it's just fine too. Actually, I wouldn't even have to upgrade if my workflow hadn't changed drastically. Without going into details, I now need exponentially more horsepower than I needed before in order to be able to keep working in real time and not have to render every step of the way from a certain point onwards. That said, the newer versions of macOS and Windows have become more taxing on the processor. With an older processor, you'll notice that it just doesn't have the processing headroom to be able to cope with those little CPU spikes that are often caused by small dynamic background processes like services checking in with the cloud, etc. This is especially noticeable if you want to run natively at low buffers. If you don't know what that means, it means recording without audible delay on the sound of your inputs. So even if your older computer is capable enough during mixdown, you might have noticed it's struggling while recording at low buffers. I have. The same Mac Pro was solid at that task when I first got it, many Mac OS and Pro Tools versions ago. A few years ago, however, it had gotten so bad that it was plain unreliable for recordings. Whether I was recording 24 tracks or one, it was immensely frustrating. <laughs> I could make a lengthy series of videos on that subject alone, 
but none of us would enjoy that very much. Now, Evo, I hear some of you think, you could have just turned off all those processes. Well, yes and no. Most of them can be turned off indeed, but some of them can't. Not in any easy kind of way anyway. Then there's also the matter of actually finding the processes that are the culprit. Pro Tools, like many DAWs, have documents associated with them with suggestions on how to tweak your system, what to turn off and what to turn on. But this is an ongoing research process. I found out after many hours of trying what they suggest and still having an unstable system, that a Mac OS process they hadn't even mentioned was actually causing show-stopping errors on my system. Okay, enough said on that. The trend of OSs is to incorporate many dynamic processes, which is simply a trend that doesn't seem to play nice with the real-time, low-buffer nature of audio recording and production. And since my workflow has changed, and I now not only need good low-buffer recording performance, but a lot more horsepower during mixdown, which is generally done at high buffers, I'd have to carefully consider my next computer. So instead of the low-level or mid-range Mac Pro I'd normally buy and use for about a decade, I would now need a higher-end model. Previously, the Mac Pros used to start around 2.5K. My last Mac Pro was about 3.5K. That was the most I'd ever paid for a computer, and honestly, I'm not prepared to spend more on one. Currently, the Mac Pro starts at over 6K for an 8-core. The 16-core model would cost me about 10k. It's just not going to happen. It's a great computer, but simply a bad price to performance ratio for audio. I've never minded paying a little extra for Apple to get the ease of use and a superior build quality, but to pay double to four times as much? No, not gonna happen. By the way, it's not that Apple grossly overcharges for the new Mac Pro's parts. It doesn't necessarily. It's more of a case that they choose to use expensive server-grade parts, which are designed to work at 100% 24-7. And there's something to be said for that, but this is currently something that is more desirable for a video producer than an audio producer. Allow me to get a little more technical to give a little insight into why this is. I'm not a computer engineer, so if anyone spots a mistake in my explanation, please do let me know and I'll correct it. In video production work, you generally work with lower resolution playback in real time as you navigate around and edit. And when you export your project, you have to wait until the computer renders it in full quality. This final rendering stage can take up a long time and your processor will be pegged at around 100% for the duration of it. You can imagine that if you work all day on a project and then leave your computer on overnight to render the final result, it's actually desirable to have a computer made from server-grade parts that guarantees as much as possible that you can sleep soundly, knowing that your computer will finish your task for you. This comfort of mind may very well be worth paying 10k to you instead of 2.5k for a computer with the same kind of horsepower. That doesn't mean, however, that the 2.5K computer will fail at that task, or anywhere during its life cycle for that matter. You just have less chance of the server-grade computer failing than the non-server-grade computer failing. However, audio production works a little differently. We don't really work with low-res real-time preview. Instead, we work full-res, real-time, and during recording or composing, often at low buffers too to ensure no noticeable delay on our inputs, which makes it extra difficult for the computer to cope with. Now, with DAWs, you can also do an offline export at the end, which renders it, much like a video render. But this is done for different reasons. The offline audio render will actually be faster than the real-time export. In the video world, there's generally no chance that the computer will even be able to perform a real-time full-res export. Exporting your one-hour video might take hours and hours or all night. It's a necessary evil in video. Then why can an audio export be even quicker than real-time? Well, it's because the audio engine you use while working is real-time. And there is a lot of dynamic things happening in music, which cannot always be predicted by the computer. 
it cannot look ahead like in a render situation. So in order to be able to process everything, the computer needs to have a lot of reserve processing power at its disposal to be able to handle everything the music throws at it. The lower the buffer, the more processing headroom is required to provide reasonable stability. In low buffer recordings, it's possible that your processor is running at 1% typically, but sometimes suddenly gets a spike of 80% because it has to calculate something complicated in the audio or because of a background task. The low buffer means that it only has a very short window of opportunity to process all of that. If it can't, that's where you get pops and clicks, distortion, or even the playback or recording stopping. When you mix your music, you can generally raise that buffer a lot, even to maximum, which gives the computer more freedom to spread out its tasks over the length of that buffer time, which effectively means that it can handle a lot more processing load without the risk of not being able to complete in time and therefore introducing unintended distortion into the audio or stopping altogether. It's rare for a real-time audio export to last more than an hour. Most run only for a minute or two for a song, but for film scores, it can be an hour or more. So does an audio producer generally need a server-grade computer? Well, not necessarily. If you run a professional recording studio and just want the most reliable system you can buy and don't need that much horsepower, you could be very happy with just the eight core Mac Pro costing around 6k. However, you still wouldn't necessarily have the best 8-core processor for your job. Why? Well, it's because the server-grade Xeon processors in your Mac Pro have been picked not to be the quickest, but to be the most reliable. The real-time nature of audio, however, dictates that the quicker your processor is, the better, providing it is stable and can be cooled quietly enough. So perhaps an 8-core processor that is 20% faster than the Xeon, but hasn't been picked to be able to run at 100% 24-7, is a better choice for audio producers. In the Intel world, this is where the i7, i9, and i9X come in. Especially the i9 and i9X, which go up to 18 cores. Over on the AMD side, this is represented by the Ryzen series, which currently go up to 16 cores. Stay tuned for the next episode to find out which chip I ended up choosing and why.